Architecture for him was a social process, was a social phenomenon, was a social mission. It was not just about aesthetics and good engineering and, and pretty buildings. It was about what happened inside those buildings and how those buildings came to, to, came to life. We felt engaged. We felt that we had a legitimate voice. He didn't talk about architecture to talk about architecture. He talked about architecture because it was an extension of the human experience. He was able to inspire people and capture them in a way that no one else could do. He just never had a small idea. Everything was about changing all of his ideas. His whole brain was working around changing the way everything is done. Could it become something bigger, greater, grander? World domination! In 2006, we went to the south of England. The real purpose was to go back to all the places that Rod had grown up, gone to school and everything. And these places they hadn't been back to in 60, 70 years. But I remember we, we were standing on the street in front of the house he grew up in. And he stood there by himself for the longest time staring at the house. He didn't say anything. After a while, I walked over and stood beside him. And I always remember what he said. What a fucking dump. To him, it was amazing. He'd forgotten what it was like where he came from. And I think he found it very difficult to understand where he came from to where he ended up. He chose Canada. He was one of its best offenders. He would take all comers, and particularly whenever we would go back to England, he would argue to the death with anybody who, who tried to uh, say that Canada wasn't everything that he believed it to be. It's one thing to look back 50 years and say, wow, you know, a group of immigrants in their 30s won the biggest commission of the year in Canada. In the moment, uh, Rod was very conscious of it as a social phenomenon. If a country can open its doors this quickly, and, and give opportunity to people this young and recognize skill uh, over everything else, it says something about where he is and, 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 and what country he's living in and, and what opportunities uh, await him. The thing I learned from both of my parents was that you take risks. You take the risk, you take it to its, to its very end. You do it in a visceral way. You mortgage your house, which is what he did when he went after the Sky Dome. The Sky Dome was the first. It was the bravest, it required more raw courage than I've seen just about at any other time in my career. Damn the Torpedoes describes the way he would go at a project. There was nothing that could change him from the course he was taking, and it was full speed all the time. Architecture is a team sport, and you can't just sit there in an ivory tower and uh, come up with a design. It's always something that is um, done through very, very hard and sometimes hard-fought argument. I think that you don't ask yourself that question. You say to yourself, this will work. You put your complete intellectual and technical skill behind what you're doing. You put every resource you have behind what you're doing, and you don't stop to think it might not work. That's the way I think Rod approached it. Is it working for its purpose, but also is it enjoyable? Is it something that people can feel comfortable with? Is the windowsill at the right height for a kindergarten room? Because if it's too high, kids can't see out. So they're not getting the stimulus that they genuinely need. What I really loved about my dad was his inherent silliness, his sense of humor, his ability to look beyond the serious nature of some particular thing and find the stupidness in it. All things British were kind of cool. And, and part of that was also Monty Python, which if there was ever a, a, an architectural firm modeled on a comedy troupe or vice versa, that's probably the closest that the two ever came to synergy as comparables. I remember watching my dad watching Monty Python, and I didn't get any of it. This is bizarre. And the next day, uh, coming home, and in equal glee and laughter, talking about how, how he and Rod had both walked in that next morning, and virtually every other architect would walk in 
doing it from the Department of Silly Walks. And they all walked the entire length of the, of the corridor down to the back of the, of the office and back again, all doing the same walk. Rod decided that he was going to dress up with my jeans and my Sid Vicious shirt and the, the jacket with the studs on it and have a, a fake mohawk and the whole nine yards as part of the celebrations of the street party. So I say the neighbors were highly amused. Our house was always barely controlled chaos. Uh, my mother was always a wonderful calming influence. However, the general feeling was if you weren't yelling, you weren't being heard. Sunday dinners were uh, always really funny. Like me, my uncle, and my grandfather, and my mom, we would always make fart jokes, and my grandmother would be sitting there just rolling her eyes like, I can't believe these are my offspring, <laughs> and my husband. Your letter of January the 13th that dropped like a steaming turd on my desk today. So I never met the man. I only knew he was a genius, visionary architect. So I called him up and I said, well, you and I have to get together. <laughs> I need to meet you. My favorite expression was, sweetie, are you, are you free for lunch? And I don't think I've ever seen him sit at a table where there weren't too many chairs. He always seemed to know that someone else would be coming along and that that person deserved a chair too. And, and really, the lunches were about anything, but mostly they were just about drinking wine and hanging out with your buddy. He loved, he loved talking to people about what they were doing, what they wanted to do. I find myself actually very lucky as his granddaughter because he was always, always pushing that idea for me. He was always saying, you know, do whatever you love. If you love painting, then seriously, do it every day. I always enjoyed that about him, and I'm definitely going to take that with me. When my dad died, Rod made a point of, of coming up to the house. He sat down and he explained uh, my dad to Annabelle, and I don't think anyone ever had. And all the missing pieces that my little sister um, had questions about, he had stories about. And um, it, was, it was really moving. It was so tender, but it was also um, so responsible um, and, and so generous. I will miss the grand scheme of pretty much life, the world. There wasn't a platform that was too small or too large for him to look at. But I've never seen such a profane, ingenious, politically wired, complex, fascinating individual. Well, well, he's an amazing guy. I, I really would like, if anybody takes anything away from what he did, in particular in the later part of his career, don't throw those who are 70, 80, 90 away. Architecture is an old man's game. They all have something to contribute. He was always friendly, he was always very considerate of young architects, and he always had something nice to say and an idea to contribute to whatever they were working on. This was, of course, a dangerous situation because some young architect would be working on a condominium, and after Rod left, he would be working on a space station. Think about all the things that he did. You know, the Army, to a career in architecture, to art, to the Order of Canada, to the Da Vinci Award a family, a father, grandchildren, and, and involved and interested in all of it. To me, that's, that's a great thing. That's, the li that's a life worth living. <laughs>